Now, to preface this next section, I'm going to briefly talk about something known as Death of the Author. I'm certain many of you are familiar with this already, but for the benefit of that one person in the audience who has literally just now heard this term, in short, Death of the Author refers to a style of media analysis. It basically means that the author of the story, who they are, their intent, what they have said about their own work, or the context of when and where the story was created, should not affect how the story is viewed and analyzed. Sounds reasonable. After all, every story has to function on its own without any kind of meta-knowledge. When utilized in moderation, Death of the Author is a crucial component of truly objective analysis. Without it, we leave the door open for the author to patch up their work retroactively, or try to justify all of their screw-ups by all sorts of limp comments like uh, uh, actually, this was what this was, uh, and this is how this works. No, you wrote the story, it is finished, it is published, you got paid for it, it has to be cohesive on its own, now shut the fuck up, do better next time. Or alternatively, sometimes the author might even try to argue that their work is actually about something utterly contradictory to what is happening on the screen. Which is just hilarious. It is the trademark of misguided writers, trying to make a point in their story and then failing so spectacularly that their work ends up making the exact opposite point. Using Death of the Author also frees the audience to appreciate art for its actual merit and to not be burdened by its origin. For example, it allows the fans of Ruroni Kenshin to remain fans of the story even after the author of the manga was outed for being... Um, <clears throat> the big oof. Or it allows us to look at a drawing such as this, see that it is constructed quite well, and give it a big ol' thumbs up. It's a nice picture. It may not set your world on fire, but it is made competently. You know who made this? Well, it was made by this guy. I may see many creators as unworthy pieces of human filth, but that will never affect my analysis of their works of fiction. If something is good, it's good, and if something is lacking, then it is lacking, no matter who made it. Equality, objectivity, the same rules and standards for every artist and every piece of art. Simple enough, no? These are my standards. This is how I generally approach media. I care about the story, what is presented in the work itself, and only that. At best, the words of the author can offer an interesting clarification to an already functional work. In Wally, -E, the human support axiom have grown fat and lazy due to being coddled by fantastical technology for generations. That is what is happening on screen. However, in the audio commentary for the movie, the director, Andrew Stanton, offered a neat factoid about his thought process for the design of the humans. According to him, the idea was to invoke the image of adult-sized babies. As in, humanity has devolved to the stage of infants, and now they must learn how to stand on their own feet anew, as seen in the ending sequence of the movie. As you see, both interpretations work, they don't fundamentally change the narrative. This is an obvious way to identify a well-presented story. Even if the audience misses parts of the intended point, the story still functions all the same. A moment ago, I stated that Death of the Author should be utilized in moderation. While it is a useful tool in objective analysis, it also has some major pitfalls. You see, this style of analysis, separating the artist and their intent from the art, can often lead into excessive focus on the audience experience instead. Or in other words, navel gazing. If taken to the extreme, distancing oneself from the original intent of the work can create viewpoints lacking any semblance of objectivity. We enter the realm of pure subjectivity. This goes by many labels. It's sometimes known as postmodernism, sometimes it's reader response theory, other times it's critical theory. According to this kind of media analysis, the feelings, ideas, 
and personal views of the audience take priority when assessing the text. Context, facts, reality itself is removed entirely. In other words, it's utter horseshit. The viewer can dismiss the actual events on the screen, the objective story elements, and just invent their own meaning. Everything is nothing, nothing is everything, anything can be anything. All that matters is how the story made the audience feel. In the worst case scenario, we end up with some sad delusional weirdo claiming that Middle Earth is secretly populated by trans people. Like in most things in life, the effective path, the truth, lies somewhere between two extremes. More often than not, if we just take a brief moment to actually look, and listen, and think what is presented in the narrative, the author reveals their intent plainly to see. Every story carries something about the author, their fancies, their philosophies, their ideals. The writer tries to communicate something via their story, obviously. In one way or another, the writer always inserts themselves into the story, not necessarily consciously, nor in the form of a character, but as an overarching arbiter of values and ethics. This may happen either subtly, or quite in your face, but it absolutely happens. The values of the story are the values of the author, there is no question about that. No one fights against themselves in their own stories. Simple example. No writer who considers themselves an animal lover would ever create a hero character who likes to kick puppies in their free time. If a character decides to do something so heinous for whatever reason, the story always condemns this action in some way, either thematically or by some other character outright stating the fact. And if not, then we can be justified in assuming that the author is actually a psychopath. This is basic communication of ideas. Valorous acts and ideals are shown as good, and villainous things are shown as bad, in accordance as to how the author views the world. The most obvious way this manifests is those soapbox moments where the characters simply blurt out the moral of the story, you know, those you see I've learned something today moments. Something more subtle is when the villain of the story has a quote unquote point. They are altruistic in their goals, at least as far as they see it. In these situations, it is the job of the heroes to call out their misguided views, hypocrisy, or flawed logic, and to stop them from enacting their evil. In rare cases, the author may showcase a certain type of restraint and humility, crafting a narrative where two opposing sides are shown to be righteous in their own ways, with no true victor in the conflict. The story basically throws up its hands and declares, I'm sorry, I just don't know. The world is grey sometimes, and to see that acknowledged by writers is an exceptional occurrence becoming ever more rare each passing year. Now, with all of that being said, let's bring this whole thing back around to the main topic at hand. I'll just play this clip to you, and afterwards, well, you'll see. Ethics involves telling right from wrong, and wrong from other wrong, etc. ad infinitum. Today, we'll discuss destiny and autonomy what is inevitable, and what is unintended. In her groundbreaking theory, The Choices of Mortality, my favorite philosopher posited that the absence or presence of fear determines both love and hate. Fear of the other is the fuel of violence. It really begs the question, who if anyone, can we trust? Mm. Rosemary, do you have any thoughts regarding our little friends here? Uh, I think... I think they 
should both have spikes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Both? <laughs> or neither. Rosemary, your affinity for balance, for fairness, for justice is clear. But lesson one, we must not let the mere presence of weapons determine our actions. Write that down, class. It'll be on every ethics test for the next three years. So what is happening here? We have a character, a teacher, part of an institution training the fresh generation of warrior heroes, tutoring them about ethics. This irrefutably noble character, at least in the narrative of the show, quotes her favorite philosopher. Her thoughts aren't challenged. This is not a setup for some larger theme. It is not meant to be pondered further. In fact, it has no link to anything in the episode. It is simply a non sequitur idea shoved to the forefront just because. For the sake of being there. The show is making a definitive philosophical statement here. The author is talking to the audience directly. Sure, I'm game. Let's get smashing! Fear determines love and hate, presented as a dichotomy between good and bad, positive and negative, harmony and violence, where the fear of the other is the source of all violence. Absolute nonsense. Do athletes in contact sports fight because of fear? No. They fight in a consensual test of strength to determine who is the better. Does the fox hunt and kill the rabbit because of fear? No, it kills the rabbit because it wants to eat. Does a person rob his fellow man because of fear? No, they do it because they are selfish and want free stuff. Does the evil empire invade a smaller nation because of fear? No, they invade because their leaders want more taxpayers, resources and political influence. Does the sick individual who violates a child's innocence do it because of fear? No, the sick individual does unspeakable things because they are fucked in the head, they have developed disgusting desires, and they do not care how much suffering they cause in pursuit of satiating their urges. Violence does not stem exclusively from fear. There are a myriad of motivations for violence. In the same vein, hate is not necessarily linked to fear. You can hate someone without fearing them, and you can fear someone without hating them. Let's say you have a messy breakup. Someone hurts you badly, they lie, they cheat, they play you for a fool. After it's all over and you inevitably split up, do you hate them for hurting you? You might, and you would be perfectly justified in doing so. But do you fear them? Of course not. Why would you? On the flip side, when fear is the motivator of violence, it can just as easily be seen as the purest sign of love. When you protect your family from someone meaning to hurt them, risking your own life to fight off the offender, that is due to your love, the fear for their safety. Or when a police officer puts themselves on the line for complete strangers and are forced to enact violence on criminals, they do it because it's the right thing to do, because of their love for their fellow men. Once again, the fear for their safety. Fear in itself is not good nor bad. It is simply a human emotion. It can manifest in a myriad of ways. At its core, it is an important tool for our collective survival as a species. It tells us when to fight and when to flee. The show offers nothing of value here. It's all a bunch of meaningless words strung together into an incomprehensive mess. The topic the writers are trying to address is far more complex than they can ever hope to fathom. And that's not even going into the fact that the visual presentation is completely backwards. 
the creature being assaulted is the one that's cowering and there is no fear present in the violent creature, it's merely being a dick just because. So where's the fear of the other that supposedly fuels violence? The show itself just proved themselves wrong, contradicting their own statement as it was being said. Now that is some hilarious incompetence. And then we have the second part. Removal of spikes equals balance, fairness, justice. If we remove spikes, the weaponry, or in other words, the capacity for violence from everyone, then we would achieve love and harmony, completely ignoring the entirety of human history and psychology. Before we had firearms, we had swords, and before swords, we had sticks, and before sticks, we had our bare fucking fists, not to mention the willingness to use them, Humanity will always find ways to hurt one another, and there will always be selfish people willing to hurt and subjugate others by force for their personal gain. Should we amputate everyone's arms, their legs, rip out their teeth, so that no one can hurt anyone, just to be sure? If we follow the logic presented in the show, then yes, everyone would be equal, everything would be fair, Society would be perfectly balanced, as far as the capacity for violence is concerned. Utter insanity. Whoever wrote this drivel has the mental maturity of a six-year-old. All of this is blatant misuse of language and subversion of basic common sense. These kinds of sweeping statements lacking any kind of nuance are the prime way of identifying an underdeveloped mind and soul. These ideas fall to pieces with even the smallest bit of critical thinking. The creators of this show are not equipped to lecture anyone on ethics. Further evidence of the writers lacking grasp on morals are the myriad of contradictions in this episode alone. They talk about love and harmony and all that mushy stuff, claim to be advocating for fairness and balance, and yet the quote, heroic guardians and the academy training them are free to commit whatever dubious acts they please. Forcefully transmuting living creatures to illustrate a vague point? A okay. Using caged dragons as sparring fodder for the students? Sure thing. Poisoning the students and turning them into crimes against nature? Absolutely fair game. Fear of the other is the fuel of violence, according to the show, so who the fuck is afraid of who here? Is the teacher afraid of her students? Is that why she poisons them? It's pure absurdity. Down the line, the show is filled with stuff like this. Blatant hypocrisy, notions of right and wrong turning on a dime, however it suits the creators at the moment. Moving forward, the curriculum in the academy includes something known as everything hours. The premise is that each day the students get a free period to train in any subject they wish. In addition to the obvious choices such as combat training, or... or just combat training, the students can also pick subjects like pottery, ballet, or playing the loot. Supposedly, these accumulated skills will be tested by sending the kids on harrowing adventures to dangerous locations around the world. Now pray tell, how the hell is ballet supposed to help you when faced with a goddamn dragon? This is a school for warriors and combat mages. Why would anyone choose to focus their energy on random hobbies, instead of honing their fighting skills? You know, the thing keeping you from dying on the field? Why would the school even allow this? Again, this is a school meant to train warriors, with the duty of protecting the realm and its citizens. If any of them wish to train in whatever extra thing piques their interest, then let them do it on their own time. When was the last time you heard about the army training people how to do pottery? Well, you haven't, because that would be utterly retarded. The show treats combat school as summer camp, 
full of fun activities and games. It's demented. And in the same episode this is introduced, after it is specifically stated that the students should nurture their skills in any field they wish, to be free to do whatever the fuck they want, to be themselves, the same students are chastised for being individuals. The students are ordered to craft their own oath as guardians, to state their desires and the path they wish to walk, and then they are all called out for being dumbasses because their individual desires are wrong. Here comes the faculty, spewing a ridiculous litany of vagaries that can be interpreted in infinite ways, but to the untrained ear sound good and righteous. It's all meaningless virtue signaling trite. But that's the show in a nutshell. If the first episode was lame and annoying filler crap, then the second episode is where the show truly kicks the nonsense into overdrive. It's just contradictions upon contradictions. No idea is developed, nothing is sufficiently explained, stuff just happens, everyone is a goddamn moron, the main setting of the show makes absolutely no sense, there is no cohesion, not in terms of world, characterization, morals, or narrative in general. Watching this show, you don't need to know anything about the writers beforehand to come to the conclusion that they are all twisted between the ears. A mess of this magnitude doesn't come from time constraints, or inexperience, nor even incompetence. The style and attitude this show employs to storytelling is simple and pure indifference. The author, none of them, care about storytelling. In their mind, anything they say goes, no matter how ridiculous it is. They make the rules, they say what's right and moral, even if they contradict their own rules moments later. They have fully revealed their values. Subjectivity, narrow self-centered thinking, moral relativism. It is truly frustrating to sit and watch as a gang of cartoonist cunts shovel endless truckloads of narrative garbage on the screen, while getting paid for it. I'm not exaggerating when I say that every moment of this show is pure pain. The one thing I loathe the most in lackluster storytelling is when the author insults the intelligence of their audience. Write what you know is one of the oldest writing advice out there. So logically, if you don't know shit, then you shouldn't be writing anything. Yet here we are. On a lighter note, I'm finally done with episode 2. At this rate, I may actually be done with this crap by the end of the year.